well, are, are we in, Chrissy? Have a holly jolly Christmas. Okay. It's the best time of the year. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. For I don't know if there'll be snow, but have a cup of cheer. All right, we must all be here. And here we are in our December Leadership Summit session. So of course, tis the month for festive music. But Arnie, you are right, I saw your, your chat. And yes, where was Bing? We'll see if we can take you out of here with some white Christmas. <laughs> but it's really great to see you all. We have such a great turnout today. Um, I'm sitting here in front of my Zoom fireplace, but really in Spokane, um, we don't have snow. Um, it's about 35, maybe 36 degrees. Um, but I see some of you here from California and Arizona even um, probably have a pretty good dose of sunshine that you can shine our way today. Um, but just a reminder that we are very honored to have Dr. McCullough with us today as our featured speaker. Before we dive in, we do have just a couple of announcements and reminders. We wanted to take a minute to just circle back to the purpose and the goals for our monthly Leadership Summit series. These sessions, this is our fourth. Um, the summit's focus really has three parts. The first is to further develop and provide education to you, our volunteers, as leaders with Jesuit values who will lead us through new and unprecedented challenges and opportunities, as you've certainly already proven this year. Um, the second is to allow you all to grow in community together and get to know one another as a true Gonzaga Leadership Network. And then finally, to keep you informed of Gonzaga's most urgent challenges and opportunities, and to have you in the conversation with us as we're navigating these. Um, again, the summit was supposed to be on our campus. We were supposed to be together shaking hands and having in-person conversations. We certainly hope that will be the case in 2021. But for now, um, we're making the best progress we can in this virtual format, and we really have appreciated your partnership and showing up every month. So thank you. Um, your post-session surveys have been really helpful. In the last uh, survey, you shared that you really liked the full group experience and not breaking out into the breakout rooms. And so today, that will be our format. We will be here together as a big group for the entire duration of the session. I get to announce our January session. Um, you can mark your calendars for Thursday, January 21st, where we'll be joined by Gonzaga's Associate Chief Diversity Officer, Robin Kelly, for a session entitled, A Conversation on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Gonzaga, The Path from Where We Are to Where We Need to Be and you'll see registration opening for this just shortly after Christmas. You'll find that in your email. And now for some exciting news. You are among the first to learn that just in time for the holidays, we now have a new Shine Zagnation Alumni and Friends mobile app. There it is on your screen, yes. Um, you can download this at your Apple or Google App Store. Um, I can hear the oohs and ahs. Oh, we have been so excited about this. This has been on our wish list for a while now. The slide, of course, has all of the details and instructions. Um, the app will serve as your one-stop shop for all of your Gonzaga information. You can access the Gonzaga magazine, upcoming virtual events, basketball information, Right now, you even have the opportunity to share messages of encouragement with our student athletes. And because it's December, we have our Christmas Advent calendar with daily offerings to deck your Gonzaga devices, make them get the Gonzaga flair. And maybe you want to sit in front of a, a Zoom fireplace for your next meeting. So you can find all of that on our app. Okay, and now I will hand this over to the person you are really here to hear from, 
Um, we will have time for questions. It would be really helpful as Dr. McCullough is speaking and sharing, if you could just put your questions in the chat as, as you're thinking of them, and then we'll have some time to answer all of them before the end of the session. And as we close out 2020, um, we all know that it has certainly been a year. And Thane, I know I speak for all of our leaders here on the call today that we are just so very grateful for your time to share your reflections um, in what has certainly been an incredible year in so many ways. Um, so thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And thank you to everybody who's, uh, who's joining. This is great. I uh, want you to know that um, I, I also get fatigue with the screen and all that kind of stuff, but it is such a cool thing to see how when it works well and, and when we're able to uh, maintain the connectivity, uh, tools like this allow us to uh, be connected with one another simultaneously in this way. And so uh, it's great to see everybody here um, uh, this year is certainly one that um, I think has served to underscore some truths, one of which is that uh, we should not and must not take things for granted, uh, that um, we all too readily uh, kind of slip into uh, to doing often. Um, and so um, I just want to say that uh, as I... I know many people within the Gonzaga community have in one way or another been touched by the impact of COVID um, either within their families or, or themselves or um, extended family members or coworkers. Um, I, I, am, I am hoping that uh, you are healthy and that you've been able to uh, avoid contracting the virus, but if um, your own situation has been touched, please know that that uh, we're thinking of you and and we're in solidarity with you. Um, it's a, been a very very challenging year in so many different ways, and uh, and so acknowledging that uh, this really is an opportunity to to uh, form community with one another in the face of this really challenging time is something I'm grateful for. My hope is that um, I can provide some thoughts for you, some reflections on the year, and then uh, really open it up for some engaged uh, conversation because that's a lot more fun. Um, I have, uh, become more humble over time about what it is that I have to say and often find that it's much better to listen and much better to um, to try to engage. So uh, please know that I will frame up some things just to sort of, um, if you will, provide you with some perspective, but uh, really interested to know what's on your minds as well. And I'm grateful because for us, you really are a critical part of the work uh, in that you um, have the ability and, and have many, many times um, exercised this in terms of being our best advocates and ambassadors and, and um, really to do that work effectively, we understand that you need to know uh, what's going on or have, have greater insights perhaps than others might. So just, um, just know that uh, we really are grateful for you and um, and we do not take uh, your activism and engagement for granted. Um, one of the things that we are seeing across the country uh, during this season is that um, echoing a fairly significant uh, finding that um, was just reported this morning uh, by the National Clearinghouse Research Center. Um, applications for college are down. Uh, across the country. Um, and uh, they're down among the Jesuit universities in many cases as well. 
Uh, but as it happens uh, at this point and in time up till this point, we, we actually are just a little bit ahead of last year, uh, which is a really, really good thing uh, from our vantage point. Last year was, was, a, was a good year to start with in terms of our applications. Uh, and then COVID hit, uh, but uh, we're actually a little bit ahead of last year's total, and uh, we're we feel very grateful because that means that at least we can engage uh, with these prospective students in ways that give us a shot at at um, continuing to build healthy enrollments for the institution, and of course that's a vital part of um, our continued uh, success and our ability to continue this work. So we know that a lot of those applications are a function of uh, alumni and uh, friends and supporters saying, hey, you know, have you thought about Gonzaga? Uh, and uh, that often is a really uh, in, important question that begins a whole chain of events that um, for many, many of our students uh, becomes, uh, you know, being here and, and being part of what we're doing. So um, thank you, and uh, I hope that uh, you're doing well. Uh, maybe in the in the context of the questions, we'll find out more about how how everybody's doing. Uh, but uh, I thought what I would do is to uh, just kind of uh, give you first some perspective on on where we are um, and sort of how we've been trying to move, and then um, you know then go ahead and and uh, uh, provide some insights uh, or, as I say, perspective from my angle on, on uh, some things that have been happening and then open it up. Um, I, I shared earlier in, uh, in, in November with my colleagues in, in our advancement division that, um, you know, one of the huge takeaways from this whole situation is that um, I think it's an invitation for us to uh, do some uh, significant reframing, reframing our understanding of where we are, reframing our expectations, reframing, you know, our perspective on what this moment means and and what it holds. Uh, I feel very blessed because uh, enough people decided that if we were able to continue doing this work they in turn would be willing to continue doing it with us such that uh, we've been able to kind of keep things moving. I've been very grateful that the state of Washington allowed us to invite students back to campus because not all states have done that. And um, not all jurisdictions have felt that they uh, could do that. Um, but so many of our programs uh, really involve hands-on experiential uh, types of work when you think about professions like nursing or, or engineering or uh, some of the work that's going on in the sciences, which is now so heavily research-based. It's very difficult to create uh, remotely delivered analogs uh, to having students actually in the environments where they can acquire the skills uh, that um, that truly can only be acquired when you do it uh, working together with a faculty member and other students. So um, to be able to continue to do this work has been um, really, really uh, significant for us. And um, one, of the, one of the learnings out of this whole experience is that when we really underscored for our students that a lot was at stake and and that really it was up to us to try to put together the plans and, and then actualize them as a community. Uh, our students really stepped up. They, they had uh, a really good attitude from the, from the outset. There was a tremendous amount of gratitude on the part of our students and, and parents as well that, that we were creating the opportunity for students to continue, whether it was on campus or or via remote technology and, and people have really hung in there and where they've been on campus, they've been adopting all of the protocols that we need them to and uh, working together to try to keep themselves healthy. 
um, and uh, where our students have been learning online, whether here or from somewhere else, uh, I think we feel as a community that that they've really done a tremendous amount to remain engaged. And, uh, and I think faculty too have really tried to be creative about how to keep people engaged, which is, which is as all of us know, sometimes difficult when you're um, spending so much time in front of a screen and there's so many distractions uh, that can be uh, in your environment as opposed to being in a classroom or being in a lab or being in the field. Um, so all of this is really an, an opportunity for us to, um, to come uh, with an awareness that uh, we have been very, very lucky and, and very privileged to be able to continue to do this work uh, because our students and families continued to believe that it was important uh, to engage. And while we did not have quite the number of first year students that we originally had hoped for, because some of them said, I, I just uh, don't feel safe uh, coming to campus or, or I, I don't feel comfortable doing online work at this point. I'd rather take a step back and, and sit out for a while until we have a better sense of how this is going to go. Um, the majority of our students did. 85% uh, of the students uh, who we expected to be here in the fall actually ended up coming uh, to be part of the class that entered the, in the undergraduate fall 2020. And, and of that number, uh, which is about 1,150 students, about 15% elected to continue their work from home or some remote location as opposed to being on campus. But we did, we did end up with almost 2,000 students living on campus this fall. Uh, and that notwithstanding the fact that uh, we made the decision to not require students to live on campus for the first time, whether they were first, second year, or returning students. We said it's it's entirely optional, it's your decision. Uh, so a lot of students ended up living on campus and uh, dining on campus and for much of the fall, even being able to use the fitness center in limited, limited form until a very recent uh, restriction was introduced by the governor to try to limit uh, further opportunities for contact. So I think all of this has become an opportunity for us to understand, you know, just how much creativity there is and how much uh, resilience there is. And um, those are important issues for us uh, when we think about what the whole point of a Jesuit education is about uh, in any case. But when we are uh, visited by something like this, uh, it sort of brings some of those issues into finer focus. Um, and that's not to say that everything's been, uh, you know, um, butterflies and balloons. Uh, th this has been, in many respects, a very challenging year uh, for um, everyone. And uh, people have really stepped up and worked very, very hard uh, to try to support um, people in the community. And, uh, and I'm very proud of the ways in which uh, everyone has done that work. Um, so uh, one of the one of the examples of uh, of the uh, the impact of all of this for us has been uh, the need to create a whole infrastructure on campus to support students who um, have fallen ill with COVID. Uh, there's no uh, getting around uh, the reality that uh, if you're going to bring people together in community uh, in this kind of a context, you're going to find yourself wrestling to some degree with uh, the virus and, and indeed we have. Um, I, I felt that it was important that we take a, a relatively aggressive approach at trying to introduce what is referred to in the public health venue as surveillance testing. Um, trying to randomly select individuals from both on and off campus uh, to come in and be tested and determine what the rate of incidence on campus or off campus of the virus might be and, and in effect try to get on top of it. Um, so we have uh, administered uh, a significant number of tests over the course of the, the semester starting in mid-August. 
uh, and we um, were we're pretty aggressive relative to most institutions in the country, certainly, and and many many other institutions that were trying to do this work in terms of the percentages of the population that we were routinely testing, and the and the ways in which we were trying to uh, really um, find out what was going on, and we've tried to be very upfront about what we've learned in that process through our uh, website that's dedicated to COVID-19 management called Zagon 2020, uh, which has a dashboard of both the uh, incidence level for positives as well as, um, as the uh, number of tests per week that we've uh, administered. Uh, surveillance testing and uh, walk-in testing without signs and symptoms uh, is not free. It is not reimbursed by insurance. Um, it is a cost borne by the institution. So at $100 a test, we at this point spent about $1.3 million in testing, most of that in the form of surveillance testing. A limited amount of that has been uh, when a student has presented uh, signs or symptoms that might um, give evidence of exposure. Uh, and we have uh, supported upwards of about 150 students to date uh, that have needed to uh, isolate or quarantine on campus. And then uh, we have a fairly significant number that have uh, been self-quarantining or self-isolating off campus along the course of the semester. Um, so this thing is very real and trying to figure out how to support our students, uh, support them uh, in terms of uh, staying safe and uh, limiting contact where there's an issue and making sure that they're getting food and, uh, you know, medical support where necessary and, and continuing to be able to do their educational work, notwithstanding those conditions has been really, really important. And we learned a lot in the process. We learned what it would require, um, what we needed to be doing. Our students and parents uh, really helped us to understand how best to try to meet our students' needs. And um, over the course of the semester, I feel we got better and better at uh, figuring out how to do that. So that's been a big additional labor, if you will, on top of the kind of very creative work of trying to figure out uh, how to continue coursework both remotely and, and in person, and then in some combination of the two, all of which has been going on uh, right up until Thanksgiving when we moved to an entirely remote delivered format. But we've also had other issues that we've been contending with along the way. Um, as uh, some of you undoubtedly saw, our uh, Gonzaga Black Student Union organization experienced what's called colloquially called a Zoom bombing, um, an attack on an environment like this one where um, premeditated and very, uh, you know, uh, deliberately organized uh, efforts to try to um, intrude on the digitally um, supported space where people are having a meeting or uh, engaged in a discussion, um, all of a sudden find themselves confronted by uh, behavior that's intended to traumatize, that's intended to shock and to frighten and to, uh, and to really um, create chaos in the situation. And that's exactly what happened here um, in a way that was really um, unfortunate and very scary for the Black students who were on the, uh, in, the, in the BSU meeting. Um, that was a situation that uh, uh, we ended up um, finding ourselves as a university community drawn into and trying to wrestle with and uh, and really trying to um, engage together with the BSU students and also with concerned alumni and parents and other community members to really kind of explore the impact of this, but also the implications of it. Uh, because the students uh, assumed, as I believe they, they naturally would, uh, that it was other students um, who were responsible for the Zoom bombing. And um, despite our best efforts to try to track down uh, the information uh, that would allow us to kind of know what the digital uh, footprint and identity might be on those involved with this attack, uh, we have not been able to determine 
uh, that Gonzaga students or community members um, either were or were not involved. Uh, we were able to determine that there were another number of um, internet service providers that were actually uh, both domestic and international. Um, and that somewhat follows the form of what we've learned along the way about the Zoom bombing phenomenon, uh, which is that in fact affected a lot of organizations and many universities, as it turns out, since uh, so many um, you know, communities of learning and others have moved into using tools like this. So uh, that, that alone uh, you know, was obviously a focus of our efforts. But, but even more significant, I think, was the way that this incident was interpreted in the longer term narrative of the experience of our Black students. And that is really the work that we are um, currently engaged together as a community and with them. Uh, in in thinking through and working on. Uh, it is just a very unfortunate situation that um, really triggered uh, a response that was uh, connected, interconnected by our students to many of the issues that uh, Black Americans in particular um, have in very visible ways uh, been um, dealing with and, and uh, challenged by uh, which, uh, of course, relates to the uh, protests that uh, were taking place across the country this summer and uh, to some of the other issues and incidents across time that have occurred on the campus and within our community. So uh, there's actually been a lot of work uh, that has been going on uh, across time in the university on issues related to diversity and to uh, looking at issues of equity and inequality. And uh, we have uh, created programs and we have uh, hired uh, staff members and uh, we've developed academic programs all in kind of a dialogical um, approach to uh, trying to better uh, support uh, the experience of uh, traditionally and historically underrepresented uh, students, but uh, there are lots more things to do and to be done. And so that's an area that we are going to continue to be focused on as a community. Um, and we will continue to uh, be engaging our, our broader circles of alumni and uh, parents and, and concerned uh, friends and supporters in those dialogues as we move forward. And, and one of the um, opportunities that will be teed up for this group uh, is with the next uh, leadership summit, uh, the chance to meet somebody who's truly a remarkable and relatively new addition to our community, uh, Dr. Robin Kelly, who is our Associate Chief Diversity Officer and uh, has recently joined our community from North Carolina. Uh, and has extensive experience and uh, work uh, has worked in this area for, for a long, long time. And I think is, is going to continue bringing to us a lot um, that, is, that is really going to be um, important for our community. I think it's uh, probably um, more important at this point that I uh, stop talking and, and give you a chance, though, to uh, ask questions about um, whatever it is that is on your mind. I will say uh, that um, I'll do my best to answer. Um, I'm not the subject matter expert on everything, of course, but um, I've been really grateful for one other thing that the COVID uh, phase that we've all been wrestling our way through has created, and that's a lot more opportunities to be engaged across the university community on a consistent basis and to know a lot more thereby about what's going on on a on an on a day by day basis than uh, sometimes has been the case uh, so it's uh, really uh, an opportunity uh, again for me to uh, answer your questions and also to underscore that um, I'm I'm interested in knowing what's on your mind and uh, would love to uh, thereby hear uh, from you, uh, some of the things that um, 
that you maybe you're wrestling with and you're thinking about as well. So with that, let me turn it back over to you, Cara, and I'll, I'll depend on you to kind of tee up our questions. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and just to everyone, um, you can put your questions in the chat. You can send them directly to me in the chat if you'd like. Um, we did have a question come in, Thane, um, that I know you've, you've spoken to several challenges and um, some opportunities even, um, but in terms of our students, the question is, what do you think they have most appreciated and then also been most challenged by in this last semester? Yeah, so, um, wow, there's just so many different ways of answering that question, of course. But, you know, if I could, I'd like to begin actually with last spring for a moment. Um, there's two things that were really poignant and very challenging about the spring. The first is that the, the leading edge for us of the experience of dealing with COVID-19 was that we were compelled to ask all of our students to come back from uh, Florence and from wherever they might be studying abroad. And uh, that was a, a really, really difficult moment because of course at that point in time, uh, the full impact of COVID had not yet actually hit Italy, uh, but we were seeing early warning signs that were really, uh, you know, points of concern for us. And our, our, our worry was, um, as much about the ability of the uh, Italian medical infrastructure to support and to care for our students right alongside the various issues that they might be contending with um, if indeed COVID really hit the way that it looked like it might. So we were paying very close attention to the data uh, internationally as we had students around the world. And, um, and basically asking them to kind of drop everything, pack up and come home was really, really hard because for some of you who, who may have studied abroad and uh, maybe at, in Florence, uh, you know uh, what an amazing experience uh, that kind of uh, you know, opportunity is, really once in a lifetime in many respects because though you know, perhaps thereafter people travel and stuff, it's not the same as being with a group of people and, and uh, living for an extended period in, in one place. So that was really, really hard. It turned out to be absolutely the right decision, but at the time it was a tough decision because we weren't sure. And uh, we really were trying to put their safety ahead of everything else. And that was a tough thing, I think, to, to, uh, to pr probably walk through you know, both as a student and, and parents trying to support and all that. But it was, uh, it was uh, really, uh, for me, it was kind of a, a watershed moment. Uh, and then later, trying desperately to find some way, hoping against hope that the uh, pandemic, you know, would not move in the direction it now, you know, clearly has, that we could support some form of an in-person graduation uh, because graduation is a milestone, right? It's a it's a very important moment. It's the culmination of years and years of 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 effort and a celebration, not just for this for the graduate, but for their family, all their friends. That was really really tough. So we we worked really hard to try to see if we could postpone, and then what would it mean, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so uh, you know, uh, honestly. A big part of my summer um, ended up being accompanying students who would have graduated in May uh, through a grieving process. Um, and we feel we did the remote-based graduation uh, just as best we possibly could. We really had a lot of help, a lot of involvement and expertise and participation was great in that. Uh, but if there's one request that came consistently, it was, we don't care when, we don't care how, but when it's safe to come back, please, 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 will you host some kind of a special uh, event for the class of 2020? Um, and of course, now as we turn the corner on, on into 2021, I'm having some of the same you know, questions about graduation for, for this next graduating class. So lots of, lots of change, lots of uh, you know, understanding, but still you know, absolutely understandable grief and, and, and uh, you know, sadness around some of those things. Um, however, um, 
I have also talked uh, with a lot of students who did decide to return to Gonzaga, either remotely or in person. Um, and uh, I had a chance to talk with a first year student not long ago, one of several that I've talked with over the last few weeks. And I said, you know, now that we're where we are in the, in the context of the semester, was it worth it? And uh, each and every one of them have said, absolutely. It was absolutely worth it. And I said, well, why? Um, and it just basically comes down to the people uh, that they're living with or the people that they're in class with and studying with. It's the community. Even though in some cases it's um, weird and it's articulated more through like Zoom and stuff like that, it comes down to people. It comes down to relationships. And Gonzaga yeah, has managed, despite all these challenges, to create a matrix wherein those relationships still can be created between students and one another, between faculty, uh, even between staff who are doing their work uh, on campus or, or remotely um, and serve students, uh, you know, in new and creative ways, as well as more traditional ways. So uh, I've been really gratified by that because we didn't, any of us know how this was going to work. But um, there have been some really cool responses to some of the creative changes that have been made. And uh, I've just been so impressed with our students, their willingness to, uh, to kind of, you know, enter into this and let's just try to make the very best of, of the situation that we can. And so I'm proud of them. Cara and, and Dr. McCullough, sorry, this is Joe Poss and it's good news for all of you. My camera's not working today. So you get that um, glam shot of me. I, I've received a couple of texts from folks who are not able to submit their questions via chat. So Cara, I'm gonna submit those to you, but I do, I do see Kevin O'Toole had a question, Cara, if you could grab that one and I'll just start texting these over to you. Sounds cool. great. And I'm getting some as well. So wonderful. Um, and Kevin says, hello, Thane. Um, he says, I know that most universities compete with one another against a relatively similar business model, that some are more well suited for than other um, endowment, tuition, athletics. How has the pandemic changed Gonzaga's strategy for long term post pandemic financial health? Um, well, what it has done, uh, Kevin, thanks for that question. What it's done is it's actually accelerated and amplified some of the things that we had already decided we needed to set about doing. So um, Gonzaga has uh, sort of done some re-architecture internally that's um, a little less visible externally than it is to us internally. Uh, but one example is that we have completely centralized and integrated all of the enrollment management functions for our graduate programs. And uh, that has enabled us to um, bring a great deal more power to the question where, uh, particularly for the adult and continuing learner population, um, are there needs and opportunities that we as a university can either respond to more effectively or actually create responses to. And so as we move forward, you're gonna see that the professional schools in particular uh, and those that have grad programs or mainly focus on grad populations are gonna begin rolling out more and more short course certificate programs and other kinds of opportunities for educational experience that are not defined solely along the lines of the sort of traditional, uh, say, master's degree credential uh, or kind of full ambit degree. Uh, we have a, like an, what we're now calling an executive JD program in the School of Law. It's an accelerated program that allows those students to accomplish end-to-end -end the JD, the full JD experience in two years rather than three. Um, and that is uh, getting a lot of traction. There's a lot of success that we've had, even though we're trying to keep that program uh, relatively small. Uh, so being uh, more attentive to where it is, uh, particularly in, the, in those um, populations of individuals who are interested in education, but may, may not have the time or the desire to pursue stop out of their careers and pursue uh, yet another full degree uh, is an area where we are looking at um, 
uh, where we can uh, better meet some of those needs and already with some success. Another initiative that we launched this year, despite the pandemic, um, and we knew we were placing some bets in this space and we'll, we're going to we're going to be on this journey for some time uh, is to nonetheless uh, really double down on our commitment to exploring where Gonzaga can um, have some traction uh, with larger numbers uh, and differential populations of international students. So we've launched an initiative called Gonzaga Global uh, in partnership with a, um, a third party entity uh, that is actually embedded in a number of countries where uh, international students seeking opportunities in US institutions um, um, have a lot of interest and they're going to help to um, marry us up with students uh, who are uh, able and interested. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, try to grow the number of students from international populations, which is not an area that we've had a significant number of students from for, for a long time. So part of the answer is really diversification. Um, how can we continue to serve our fundamental educational mission while doing a better job of looking at uh, populations of uh, individuals, both domestic and international, uh, that we can serve that we haven't been serving uh, robustly for some time or perhaps um, ever. And I, and I do think that part of the, the goal and the desire is to meet some other qualitative objectives that we have. We would like to increase the diversity of our scholars on campus. We would like to increase uh, the, the ambit of those um, who are coming to us with a greater uh, financial need. Uh, so uh, we see a lot of opportunity that kind of becomes a recombinant en engine towards serving a number of different strategic facets that we have had for some time. But the pandemic is really um, obligating us to accelerate uh, our move in these directions because our community is really, really aware uh, of how important it is uh, for us to continue to, to reevaluate the traditional model uh, and not depend solely on one population for you know, the vast majority of of the resources necessary to keep the work going. Um, and I think there are a lot of institutions that are um, also trying to do uh, similar things. Uh, the difference is that um, we've been laying track on some of these initiatives for several years. And so um, I feel like we're maybe a little bit further ahead uh, than uh, perhaps some other uh, institutions and we're not as far as some others. So we're gonna to continue to work this space and, and uh, continue to also pay attention to where we can develop strategic initiatives with other entities and institutions too, because I think there is strength uh, in those partnerships. And, and actually, despite the challenges with demography and economics, there are significant numbers of people who really do seek uh, education at the higher level. And we wanna be there in an affordable way to meet more of them. Thanks, I appreciate it. And I guess the common thread would be a uh, higher revenue model at a price per student rate with lower overhead or more scalable overhead. Is that kind of the, the common thread between those? those yes, I think, I think, for example, that um, many, many uh, people who uh, look at higher ed might assume, for example, that uh, graduate programs uh, ought to be more productive on a per, you know, net, net per student uh, basis than, say, undergraduates. And I believe that. I think that that is important because I think what we need to be doing is basically subsidizing and supporting the traditional undergraduate uh, education uh, to a degree because the um, complexity and the infrastructure necessary to support our traditional residential-based populations is, is great. But in, as a matter of fact, uh, our graduate programs have not necessarily or traditionally uh, you know, resulted in that um, in that uh, net per student uh, differential. And so that's, that's an area where we felt that it was time for us to really, from a comprehensive strategy, bring people together and say, we got to start managing this, you know, holistically from, from a central location. Because we've got, you know, almost 30 graduate programs. So if each of them are being ind independently managed, uh, you know, as satellite units by different people, you're going to get vastly different things going on. And that's what we found. Thanks, appreciate the answer. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. 
Um, Thane, we had a question come in. As alumni or friends of this great place, what can we all be doing to help all of you at Gonzaga? Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's a that's a great question, obviously, uh, that has so many different answers. It first starts with gratitude. I mean, I have to tell you, I I hang on to um, I hang on to these things. These are notes. Um, because I, I will tell you something. I think that um, uh, one of the truths of the of the situation is is that um, not all not all of the uh, decisions that we have been um, compelled to make, uh, regardless of what decision we made, um, have have felt comfortable or or uh, necessarily pleasing, and. Um, the belief that there are alums and that there are friends and supporters who uh, feel like, you know, what you do is important. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm behind you and, and we want you to, you know, keep on going, even in the face of difficult situations is uh, it, it makes, it makes a huge difference. And, and we've been getting those. Um, we've been really, really grateful. Um, we of course are grateful for, you know, any support um, that can be provided to, you know, our scholarship programs and to, you know, all of the other things that we're trying to do on the financial front. And we're grateful for that because our alumni are our most significant base um, of uh, supporting us in, in those ways as well. Um, but I, I re really will say as well that um, we've been keenly aware of and, and sensitive to the need uh, for support uh, for our students. Um, and that can come in, in the form of, of prayerful support. I mean, um, our students are working really, really hard and uh, their families are, are um, in some cases struggling and, and um, challenged with the economic impact of this pandemic. So um, be really manifesting that sense of uh, community support broader support is something I lean on and I tell our students about. I, I remind them that that our alumni and that and that the generations that have come before them uh, and our parents and our communities, they're behind them and they want them to be successful. So um, I just really want to say that I, I think that you do a great job of providing us with support and, and anything you can do to continue to send the message out uh, that Gonzaga might be a place that that somebody might want to take their education and and take it to the next level. We're always grateful for because there are so many times that I meet you know an incoming student, for example, and they're telling me a story about how you know their uncle's best friend, blah blah blah, and it, and you see the connections being made, and you realize how much we depend upon our greater Gonzaga family for being able to keep this thing going. So lots of lots of different ways that you do every day and that you you have done consistently. Um, anything that anything you can identify that that meets also with what you can do, we're very grateful for. Wonderful. This is probably an appropriate time to share with all of you. Um, as we're talking about enrolling our next class that so many of you help us with the application um, fee waiver, where as alumni and friends and um, leaders to us, you can refer students and nearly 800 uh, student applications, so nearly 800 of you have referred students through that application fee waiver. So. Thank you for that. That's just been exceptional. And I think maybe we can get that link in the chat as well. A couple of questions. Um, Thane, what are you hearing about the health of our basketball teams? Um, well, uh, the, let's see, where where do we begin? Um, <laughs> I, what I will tell you is that I think that uh, for the most part, uh, folks are healthy. Um, it, it became clear though that, um, you know, we, we needed to kind of take a preventative step and um, where I kind of, you know, do go by the, by the old adage of where there's smoke, there may be fire. Um, you know, it, 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 is, uh, it is so important uh, and we really have worked so hard to try to put um, the health and the welfare of our student athletes and our and our coaches and staff members 
uh, at the forefront of this project. Um, and uh, while I know that it's incredibly frustrating uh, to find uh, that we are in a position where we, we can't play, we need to, to stop out, um, in a lot of ways, um, it's really allowing us to kind of uh, take a step back and say, okay, are, are we okay? You know, let's, let's make sure that, um, you know, we're hunkering down and we're doing the kinds of things that are going to allow us to know that um, there is not a chain of transmission that's moving through the, through the team and that um, we have the potential thereby to not only continue to see infections, but infect other people too, even unknowingly and unintentionally. Um, so um, the, 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 women's, the women's team has been successful thus far. Uh, and extremely lucky as well as intentional about uh, doing what they're doing such that they have not uh, had a, had a um, reported instance and we are doing very aggressive testing on both teams on a regular basis to try to, you know, make sure that we know uh, where, where things are at. Um, but uh, we don't take any of it for granted. And, and uh, you know, part of the challenge with uh, trying to contemplate how, how do we move forward uh, with all of this comes down to um, identifying risk factors that are not in our control as well. You know, what are the venues? Uh, where are people staying? With whom are they really in contact, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there have been some lessons learned out of this experience as well, uh, some of which I think I'm probably not privy to, um, and they don't want to tell me everything. But uh, the the truth is is that um, I think that the members of the of the of the men's team and and the cadre with them are are doing are doing well and. Uh, and they're frustrated about this, um, admittedly. But um, I think you know uh, this. This was not not a you know. This has some upsides too in terms of of making sure that everybody's healthy before we resume, and uh, whatever it is that we learned out of the experience on site, etc., we can take with us into what we hope will be the resumption of play in a in a couple of weeks. Wonderful, and I want to be respectful of time. I know we have two other questions. Um, one is regarding um, our Sharon Kate is asking about how we're doing with our international students and if we were hurt by the visa issues and students not deciding to travel um, to the United States. What does the future look like, especially with the general enrollment map and that we have now for graduate programs? And then Christopher is also asking these two final questions. Um, he, he says, thank you for the swift response to the Black Student Union incident and your overall collaboration with and in support of the students. Mm -hmm. um, with COVID taking a toll on so many people's mental health and morale, how has this affected the morale of students of color? And how often are university officials working with the student leaders of color to provide reassurance and support? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, how was the outcome of the town hall? So I'll just also um, say that there is a link in the chat that goes to a recap of the town hall and also has a recording of that town hall. So you can all watch that and, and see the recap there. But they and I just wanted to mention both of those questions for the one minute of time we have left. <laughs> but I get a minute or two too, right? I mean, you do. You know, after this, so. Yeah, so um, interesting. We have a re really, really small population of international students at this point. Um, but the truth is, is that uh, the way in which we've engaged international students um, more than anything else at, in, in this particular period um, has been actually supporting those that were with us all the way from back in the spring um, who could not return to their international homes. So you call the, there were a lot of restrictions that were brought down preventing anyone from the US traveling abroad for a period of time. And there are still countries that, you know, even for their own citizens are not, are not particularly interested in having them return. That's been hard, but we have been really here for them and we've tried to do everything we, we can to continue to support those students who, from international countries who've been who've been here, 
And yes, we have been impacted by students who have not been able to uh, to come, but we have had some. Um, so we 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 were able to uh, remain uh, a viable institution, according to um, you know the State Department and and uh, you know immigration naturalization and so forth. And so we have had some international students come to us even for this fall. Um, and we're going to continue to work in that area, as I mentioned, with our Gonzaga Global Initiative. I think you're going to see a, a significant increase in international students beginning next fall at the undergraduate level and in the spring at the graduate level. So we're really excited about that. And we'll be keeping you up to date on that. Um, the second question is really important to me. Um, I, I would want you to know that I personally was in contact with the students who were impacted by the Zoom bombing on the day of the bombing. And we have continued as an administrative team and a student support services team to be in frequent and regular contact with our students. It's really, really important that they know that we are here, that we're trying to work uh, to meet their needs and, and uh, to support them. And that's not gonna stop. That's a really important part of this, uh, of the expression of, of uh, our care. And uh, we're gonna continue to do that all the way through. Um, uh, we, we felt that the town hall um, kind of got a mixed reception, honestly, because that first town hall, which is actually one of two, uh, the second one will be after the new year, uh, was really an attempt to respond directly to the requests that the BSU had made of us as an administration and not to get further down the road into the various things that we're doing as an institution uh, to try to be more proactively engaged around some of these issues. But that will be the focus of the next town hall. There were certainly some students who felt that, that it was a very good experience and it was an important thing for us to do. Uh, but as always, there are different opinions uh, that people have about what did or did not get accomplished there. So we're gonna continue to, again, be engaged with the students to make sure that um, we're really meeting them where they are and working with them so that they feel like we're, we're doing the right work. And uh, there's a lot to be done, as I said. So more to come on that front as well. Before we um, all flee to wherever we're going or stay where we are and just shut things off, um, I just really want you to know that as we are in the Advent season and uh, the beginning of, of uh, Hanukkah tonight for the for the Jewish sisters and brothers who um, you know we're connected with, uh, we we acknowledge this has been a really rough time uh, as a as a year. 2020 is one of those years that's going to go down in history as um, as a particularly challenging you know one for for our country for our world. Uh, but I am very, very grateful uh, for all of you for taking the time. And, uh, and I'm really grateful for your support, uh, the ways in which you care for, for me, for us, uh, for the students in particular, and continue to support us. You know, just please don't ever hesitate to reach out and let us know if there's something that we can do to uh, get you information or to help you know uh, better what's going on. I just know that this is a difficult time, you know, for everybody and uh, being a part of this larger community um, is a special thing. And we want you to feel uh, the way we do, which is that you are very much a part of it. And I hope if we don't have a chance to, to do this any other way, uh, that Christmas brings some measure of peace and, and joy, notwithstanding all the restrictions, uh, because uh, we, we all need uh, to seek that consolation um, in this time of the year. So, so thank you for taking the time. I, I realize it's never long enough, but I hope uh, that you, uh, you do indeed have a great Christmas and, and that we get to connect again, not too, down, not too far down the road. Thank you so much, Thane. Um, and I know we are all hoping that you get some well-deserved relaxation and time with your family um, in the weeks ahead as well. Thank and you. thank you, yes, thank you to everyone for being here, for um, taking a little more time than was planned. Um, we've just been so, um, so grateful for your partnership in this great work we get to do together. 
Um, I get to see every day what you're doing, and I can't imagine um, not having you be a part of this with us. Um, so thank you. Um, and we have one last slide that does have, we have just a couple more events happening in December. If you'd like to join us, we certainly hope that you will next Thursday. December 17th is a big one. Um, we can, you can start the day at 3.30 with the School of Leadership Studies update and holiday celebration with Dean Hunter. And um, again, that's at 3.30 in the Pacific time zone. And then that evening, we have Tis the Season for Hope, which is a fireside chat and conversation with Father Ken Crawl as well. And that is at 7 o'clock PM Pacific time. And again, you'll get the update soon for our next, the invitation to register for the next Leadership Summit session on January 21st. And that will be a very important one. And we really hope that all of you can join um, as we have that conversation together with Robin Kelly. Um, and with that, we just want to wish you, I don't know, maybe we have some Bean Crosby um, to take us home here and take us out to the season but wishing you all a very Merry Christmas, a safe, a safe and healthy holiday season, happy holidays. And we can't wait to see you in that brand new year, 2021. Um, so happy new year and please do reach out if there are any questions that we can help answer. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dan.